I don't want to be asked questions about my appearance, okay? I've been depressed and when I look hot, it makes me feel better. All right, I'm gonna try and not like stare at the viewfinder the whole time because I've been picking apart my appearance all fucking week. Um, my editor's still not here, so uh, yeah, I can still do whatever the fuck I want. And um, I've noticed a few comments in recent times about me vaping. <sighs> yeah, I do whatever the fuck I want with my body. Uh, this, believe it or not, helps me a lot in my daily life. So I would appreciate it if you didn't comment about it. The tone of this video is defined by this letter. Um, I'm not going to talk about it because I don't know if there's legal ramifications for discussing it in detail because it was due to a legal proceeding. Um, I made a PIP claim or a personal independence uh, payment claim uh, and it took over two years for the proceedings to go ahead um, and uh, I'm not going to give you a full review of what happened but um, if this is showing up in the right direction I'm sure you can read it. Uh, yeah so this uh, is a video that wasn't isn't being made because of this, it was already in planning, but the tone of the video is very much um, influenced by it, uh, and that tone being just very kind of upset. Today uh, I wanted to discuss my mental health diagnosis journey and um, kind of also complain a little bit. Uh, I don't know I don't know. I'm just going to start somewhere with this story and hope that it's helpful for me or for you, um, for somebody. The channel manager has also uh, asked me a question uh, and I will be responding to that at the end of the video. I did ask the question on my Twitter, so I don't know if you want to follow me there, you can. It's I don't really use it that much anymore, especially now that it's called X. I've been considering just leaving it because it's kind of just a cesspit of racists and crazy people. Um, and not the kind that we're going to be discussing today. Uh, so let's start with depression, shall we? Um, I first started asking in... Wow. We're going to leave that in, because why the fuck not? Um, I first started inquiring about uh, my into my mental health after I left my father's house, which we will not be going over again in this video. I'm just going to talk about my mental health, and everyone else can either listen or go away. Uh, <laughs> something that I should probably say before I continue. Um, is that if you don't sympathize with mental health illness, with disability, um, firstly, bye, you don't need to be here, this isn't the video for you. Secondly, if you genuinely don't care and for some reason didn't leave when I told you to go, um, just be aware that disability can happen to anyone at any point in their lives and even if you don't feel like it affects you now, uh, it probably will in the future in some capacity, whether it's among your friends, among your family, with yourself, with your children, with your parents, whoever. Disability affects a lot of people in their lifetime. And although people like to say that life is short, uh, I would like to remind everyone that it is also excruciatingly long. So I started inquiring into my mental health problems uh, in 2016, like roughly about a year after I left my dad's house. And it took me a while because A, my parents were not big fans of medical professionals growing up. Um, so they didn't take me to the doctor a lot. 
And I also went to an Islamic school where they didn't really offer counseling services. They had like religious people there who would ask you about your problems and then kind of just tell you to pray or be patient or do something called rukia on you, which is like the Islamic form of exorcisms. And I have gone through many of those in my lifetime. Um, yeah. Fuck all of you. Anyway, uh, after I left my dad's house, uh, which was a an awful and terrifying process in and of itself, um, I went to my general practitioner, my GP, my doctor, um, and the first words out of my mouth when I was looking into getting some help for my mental health was, um, can I see a psychiatrist? I think there's something wrong with me. And he sort of leaned back and went, well, what do you mean by that? And I told him that all of my thoughts, or most of my thoughts at that time were extremely negative. I couldn't have positive thoughts. And when I did have positive thoughts, it would make me cry a lot. And um, obviously I'd just come out of, and the GP was already aware that I'd just come out of a very, you know, traumatic and awful situation. So he was, putting down a lot of my symptoms to that traumatic situation which you know if you haven't been to the doctors I can't really blame him when you haven't been to the doctors a lot and you're telling them you have these problems their usual sort of thing to do would be to just go well you know think about it for a little bit he referred me to a counseling service and um the one thing I will hold against him is that at the time I was a hijabi um the one thing that he did recommend uh was that I either read the Quran or the Bible for help the Quran and the Bible are not mental health professionals you should not seek them to solve your mental health problems usually if you have a mental health problem there is some kind of chemical imbalance happening in your brain um, or, you know, around your body. So you shouldn't seek books that were written over a thousand years ago where mental health was not in the collective consciousness um, to seek mental help. I hope this has been a satisfying public service announcement. Um, so that's the one thing I do hold against him. Uh, after I saw him, I was referred to a counselling service, which in the UK uh, does come free, but you have to wait for a long time usually because there's wait lists for these kinds of things. So I did wait. Uh, at the time, I was filling a lot of my time working. Work was very much a priority for me because it kept me busy, kept my mind occupied. Uh, I also started studying at that time. I started doing my degree. Um, and for the most part, for a little while, I thought I was okay. Uh, I was depressed, I was anxious, um, but I thought I was okay. The first counsellor I saw, I think I wasn't really ready to see. Because obviously the GP didn't really make an in-depth inquiry of what was going on in my head. Um, and the counsellor had a really tough time digging into my psyche and I was having all sorts of sort of issues. Uh, I had a lot of trust issues at the time um, and almost constantly he would ask me a question and I would try to find a lie to suit the answer. He would ask me another question and I would try to find another lie to fit the answer and I, you know, without any prompting, slowly started to realise that I can't really be helped if I'm not honest and the honesty was part of being vulnerable which is probably going to be a lot of what I talk about today. It's really really tough for people who have these kinds of trust issues, at least in my opinion, just talking about me when I had these trust issues, to really be honest about the things that were bothering me because I was ashamed of a lot of those things. I was ashamed of being, you know, helpless. I was ashamed of being weak. I was ashamed of being depressed. <laughs> like, what am I, what am I so sad about? Like, I'm alive, right? 
um, I hadn't really come to terms with the thought that maybe being alive was the problem because I was alive with all of these perspectives and memories that weren't really that good for me. So being alive was not a benefit, it was pr part of the problem and uh, I should probably put a trigger warning but like this video is about mental health. If you're not ready to discuss issues around mental health, don't be here. Um, sorry, I don't know if that comes off as, in as insensitive, like I said my tone is very not great today but um, I just kind of want to be honest because I feel like the honesty is something that I've been trying to achieve for many years and I've gotten better at it over time and I'm at a place where I'm just I, I don't I don't have the energy to lie I don't have the energy to hide my feelings about things and I don't have the energy to also be dismissed so um yeah, this is a video, it is optional for you to watch. If it is unsafe for you to watch, do not watch it. There's other things to watch. If it's something that you would like information on or some insight you would like to have um, from an actual mentally ill person, stay tuned. Uh, hopefully this benefits you in some way. I am mainly recording this to benefit myself because that's what my whole channel is. Um, anyway, continuing. So after a few rounds of fake counselling, where I was just lying to the counsellor constantly, I decided to maybe review my choices and seek out a different counsellor that I could start fresh with, because the first one, it just wasn't working. Taking a breath. The nicotine feels so good. Don't smoke, kids. It's a bad idea. Anyway. Um, so I went to see this second counsellor, uh, it took a few weeks, um, took a little while, and when I started talking to her, I was trying to be a bit more honest and divulge parts of my life that I either, like, couldn't remember properly or I just, I, I just felt really uncomfortable divulging. And the more I divulged, the more comfortable I started to get with divulging these things. Um, she really helped me open up, but I was still not at a stage where I was ready to really confront the issues that I was having. At, at that time, it was around 2016, 2017, at that time I really just needed to unload what had happened to me. So that's a lot of what I was doing. Um, she was the first person to recommend uh, that I try antidepressants and I was really apprehensive of trying antidepressants because uh, until that point everyone who told me about antidepressants was either a member of my family or a member of my religious community and their general opinion of antidepressants were that they were a band-aid for a larger like spiritual problem. Um, that I needed to make right with God, and we'll get to God later, as we always do. Um, so I was a bit apprehensive about trying these antidepressants, and I spoke to my best friend about them, who, she was around the same age as me, she was around, um, like, just a year older than me. I love her, that's a side point, she really helped me work through a lot of my issues, but, um, I spoke to her about it and she was like, you know, loads of people are on antidepressants. I'm sure if you talk to more people about it, you know, they can share their experiences with you and like, you shouldn't be so embarrassed about it. It's medicine. It's your health. You should take it seriously. And I was like, you know what? You're a reasonable person. You're someone my age. You clearly care about me. So I'm going to take that to heart and I'm going to just start talking to people about antidepressants and tell them that I'm apprehensive about it and tell them what I'm worried about. Um, and almost uh within the next uh day or so <laughs> i started talking about it at the time i was volunteering with my local community center in wembley it was called the yellow pavilion it unfortunately no longer exists anymore but um at the time it was somewhere i was volunteering and i loved volunteering and uh i spoke to some of the volunteers about antidepressants i spoke to my then manager about antidepressants and I just felt like the biggest idiot because almost all of them had tried them at one point in their life. Some of them were, you know, taking them 
And they said that, yeah, the process is a bit challenging in the beginning because it's really hard to find what you need and then see if that works for you and stuff. But it's not that big a deal. You should try them. You should, above all, if you're feeling unwell, if this is something that is affecting you, you should try them. And I went to my GP and I told them what my concerns were. I researched uh, the process of taking antidepressants and like coming down from them and how they're supposed to work. And my GP prescribed me antidepressants. Um, I think the first uh, antidepressant I took was citalopram, which was okay. I took them for around six months and then stopped. Why did I stop taking them? Because I always thought the goal was to stop taking them. And I will resent every mental health professional and every GP that has told me that the aim was to eventually come off them. Because uh, children, you can't play games with your brain chemistry if your brain requires certain chemicals. And the medicines, a lot of the time that you take, are the ones balancing those chemicals. So if you play those games, you'll win very bad prizes. Um, so yeah, I went through loads of rounds of taking antidepressants and then coming off them and taking them and coming off them and taking them and coming off them because I always, you know, I had it in my head per these mental health professionals and per these GPs that I should eventually come off them. That was until I got formally diagnosed with flat depression. Now for reference, I do believe that I've had depression for most of my teenage years. Uh, I can't speak for my younger years. I, I honestly don't remember a lot of my younger years because of traumas that I went through back then. But um, as for what I remember about my teenage years, I can say with 100% assurances that I was a depressed teenager, but I wasn't diagnosed until around like 2017, 2018. Um, obviously, a few years after that, that was the pandemic. Um, and for a couple of years where I was depressed, uh, sorry, where I was diagnosed with depression, I kind of felt like I was all right. I was largely on and off medication sporadically because I was trying different versions. I was trying sertraline, I was trying fluoxetine, um, and then for a while I just, I wasn't taking medication. Uh, I started, you know, addressing other problems of mine that I was having. Problems sleeping, problems eating, problems socialising, um, problems at work, uh, problems, uh, you know, just in terms of my physical body. I was experiencing a lot of pain that I wasn't really expecting to feel like uh, I remember quite vividly in 2018 for a couple of years from like 2018 to 2019 I had this like really intense pain in my jaw and at the time I went to the dentist for it um, I thought it was strictly because my wisdom teeth were coming in and the wisdom teeth for reference were not helping I still have all of them in my face because I couldn't take them out on the NHS they refused to take them out um, they don't currently hurt like normally but when I am stressed or depressed oh it really starts hurting back then in like 2018-2019 uh, the pain was such that I couldn't open my mouth past a certain point without it being extremely painful like in this whole area mainly in this area but in this whole area and then at times it would sort of extend down to this area i also started noticing that when i was stressed or depressed which was a lot of the time because my medication wasn't settled my mental health wasn't settled and i was not you know a lot of the time when you're sent to these free counseling things in the uk on the nhs they only last a certain amount of time they last like either six weeks, eight weeks or 12 weeks. And then after that, you're sort of just sent out into the wild to sort of cope. Um, so I was on and off with these counseling sessions. I was on and off with this medication. I had this excruciating pain in my face that was exp extending down to like my neck and then later down to my back and then like all the way down my fucking spine, which was, if you can't imagine it, really, really, really troubling. Um, I also started getting symptoms of uh, like just poor eating habits. Um, 
and I used to have these symptoms back when I was at my dad's house like the especially the years after my mom died kind of like when she was dying but then the years after she died as well I would get these symptoms where I would dry heave for extended period of time uh, I wouldn't be able to like hold any food down because uh, my stomach would just not settle at all um, and I just wasn't eating well because of that um, and I don't know it just it all of it sort of started happening at once uh, after this like jaw thing started turning up I went to the doctors for the jaw I went to the dentist for the jaw um, they gave me a not on paper but they told me that it was TMJ um, in my jaw uh, and the dentist said that it was probably because one of my wisdom teeth was like brushing against a nerve that's why it was happening but um, the pain wasn't consistent like it wasn't there day in day out it would only happen at specific times where I was upset or stressed they wouldn't really be there if I wasn't feeling that way so I wanted to do an investigation further into that because alongside you know the depression and these pain symptoms I was also having like really bad um, hallucinations and flashbacks and um, just like anxiety symptoms symptoms of PTSD that I later learned uh, when I talked to my GP about it and I would talk to my GP quite extensively about it at this time in this year I was seeing the GP quite frequently I was seeing them like every other week if not every month trying to stay calm continuing um so i was seeing the gp quite frequently about these symptoms and uh it occurred to both my general practitioner as well as myself that i was having ptsd symptoms uh where i was constantly just like hallucinating people in the street that weren't supposed to be there i was getting like these really weird perception hallucinations where um the floor would start to sink or like if there was a texture on the floor like let's say gravel texture it would start like cycling or spinning or uh if there was like a checkered pavement they would start like waving as i looked at it uh and it, it just it just started getting really scary like i didn't really know what to do with that um i started getting panic attacks like if i crossed by certain areas of london that my family live in um i would just see the faces of like my aunts in a crowd where they weren't there um so these were PTSD symptoms that I was experiencing and uh, since this was like 2018 2019 now and all of this stuff happened in 2015 they were with the pain symptoms um, and also the illness symptoms that I was feeling when I was eating uh, it became apparent to my GP that maybe these were complex PTSD symptoms that could develop into fibromyalgia which I am now diagnosed with but I'll get into that later um, it takes a long time to diagnose things like CPTSD and fibromyalgia because a lot of the time the symptoms overlap with symptoms of other things. Um, so it, it takes a lot of discerning and talking and it's just, it's just fucking boring, honestly. <sighs> but I am glad for the diagnoses, but I'll get into that later. Um, during the pandemic years, uh, initially, I was not receiving any sort of mental interventions. I was not on any medication. Um, and I was trying to pursue psychotherapy up until the pandemic years, 2020, 2021. Um, I had only received like talking therapies, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy and counseling. Those were the kinds of therapies that I had explored. Um, and it came to my attention that maybe doing some psychotherapy, which is like a sort of more in-depth sort of look at your history and issues, um, would be more beneficial. And I pursued this uh, on my own finances. I did this privately for over a year. And to be honest, I still contact that therapist whenever I feel like I need a little bit of a, an intervention, but she is quite expensive and I can't really afford it anymore uh, at the in the pandemic years, I was using my furlough money to do it. Um, so I would see this therapist every other week, sometimes every week. I think initially it was every week. And then I started seeing it every other week. And at the time I wanted to be unmedicated so that I could track my mental health progress 
uh, while I was going through this therapy, as well as like discussing my week by week mental health updates with my therapist. So I needed like a fresh perspective on what my health, mental health was like. And obviously like the pandemic is a contributing factor you're inside all the time. You're not seeing the people that you would normally see. You're not working. You don't have your regular routine, etc. So we dug into a lot of my history. We unlocked a lot of uh, memories and such. And we kind of stopped at a point where I felt like I don't need to dig into any more memories. I think I could, I, I should work with the memories that I've uncovered. And then like, if I feel like those other memories need to be uncovered, we can uncover them. I just know they're horrible. So I don't really want to do that. Uh, <laughs> um, so during these sessions, especially in the later parts of the sessions. In the initial parts, it was just like getting to know you, going over stuff that I had already gone over with other therapists. And then like we started delving deeper into other issues um, that I hadn't really disclosed to many people, not my closest friends, not anybody. Uh, I had in my teenage years tried to express it um, to my, my, you know, my classmates and other people around me, but, um, it wasn't really being taken seriously. It was just kind of treated as, oh, that's just, that's just jinn who are haunting you. And it's just like, okay, well, that's not really helpful because I do all the prayers. I say all the duas. Um, if it's still jinn, I don't know how to, I don't know how to banish them. So that's not fucking helpful. But I started to talk to my psychotherapist about a really buried concern that I had had that I'd been suppressing for a very very long time since I was a teenager and that was the notion that I have very real hallucinations and conversations with those hallucinations and I was worried about them getting worse I was worried that my depression wasn't just depression it could be something else because there was clearly a pattern in terms of the moods um I was worried. I, I was worried. I was worried that all of these mental health issues would eventually manifest into the way they did with my dad, who clearly has like some sort of personality or psychotic disorder. Uh, I don't know for certain because he does not consult doctors. He, he doesn't believe in them. He thinks they're all gay or something. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I don't make excuses for my dad in the same way that I feel like he doesn't make excuses for me. So he's a bad person. I hate him. Let's move on. Um, so after several sessions with this therapist, she, she gave me like three or four main targets. One was to address these hallucinations, figure out what they are, and then try to make peace with them. Two was to seek some specialized help for my eating disorders because it was manifesting as a as a real problem because I had like really serious weight fluctuations. Actually, if you watch videos from that time, you'll probably notice that, that my weight was fluctuating quite rapidly. Um, the other thing was to sort of nail down a diagnosis for the type of depression that I have because it was clear that it wasn't just depression. And four was to uh, try to figure out exactly what was going on with these pain symptoms in my body. She suggested that it could be fibromyalgia, it could be complex PTSD, but she was also very aware that if those things aren't addressed from early on, they develop into worse things. Um, they just, I'm dropping everything today. They manifest in really bad ways is what I'm trying to say. Um, she was also the first person to look at me and say, have you ever pursued a diagnosis for autism or ADHD? And I said to her, no, I, I'm actually an autism specialist in my workplace. Uh, I feel like I would know if I had autism. And she said, hmm, there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of gaps in autistic research. So I would suggest that you get seen by a professional who diagnoses autism uh, and uh, you should see if you have symptoms of that, because from where I'm sitting, from our time together, from the way that I've observed you, uh, you you display symptoms of autism. And I said, wow, if I have autism and I'm an autism professional, I don't know what to do with my life, honestly. <laughs> um, but in a, in a sense, I'm just going to pick up what I dropped. Give me a second. 
in a sense, she was correct uh, about there not being a lot of research into autism. There's not a lot of research into autism for people who aren't white, and also not a lot of research into autism in women. So, you see where this is going. Um, so, after she set all these pieces of homework, I started pursuing, uh, you know, more targeted mental health support through the NHS, uh, because she had given me more or less all the help she could as a psychotherapist. She couldn't prescribe medication to me. She couldn't write me referrals. This was just a private therapist that I was seeing to seek help further to get like a better understanding of where my brain was. Give me a moment. Cause I'm gonna start getting really frustrated. So after I stopped uh, seeing her, we closed our sessions and she said, if you need any further help, just email me. We can start sessions again. But these are the things that you should probably explore before we start talking again. Um, she sent me this, let's call it homework, and I started to pursue it through my GP again. And I went to the GP and I told them all of my findings. My psychotherapist had written me like a letter to give to them and I started pursuing all these things and my GP at the time uh, handed me a pamphlet <laughs> that had all the antidepressants on it and she said, let's start you on a course of antidepressants, research all of these antidepressants, come back to us and see which ones you feel like you should be on. And I looked at her and I said, isn't, aren't, aren't you gonna recommend a a medicine for me and she said no you seem to know your mental health pretty well so you go you, you take this home and figure it out uh, and I'll refer you to the adult services we'll get you some help um, so I took the pamphlet home <laughs> like I did some Wikipedia research uh, I consulted the pharmacy and they were like yeah the doctor really shouldn't have just told you to do your own research on SSR fucking eyes and mood stabilizers um, so needless to say, I don't see that GP anymore. <laughs> um, but the GP had also rec uh, referred me, sorry, to an IUPT service and, uh, like an adult mental health service and also to an eating disorder service that I still have not heard back from. <laughs> they had referred me to an eating disorder service that was outside the area of their catchment so they couldn't see me because they were in a different borough so they were in a borough where they didn't serve people in my area so they couldn't see me so then when I told my GP that they re-referred me to the eating disorder service in that area which had closed so to this day since 2020 I have not seen a professional about my eating disorder I'm still very much just trying to make it up as I go so that's where that ended I don't have a diagnosis for that uh when I went to see the IAP service which I eventually did and oh my god he was he was so good he was so, so, so good. I cannot, I cannot sing this man's praises more. But before I started seeing him, I was on the wait list for a really long time. So before I started seeing him, I started to pursue this autism diagnosis. And um, I did this by writing a letter about the right to choose. Uh, and if you are seeking an ADHD, an autism, or a, a neurodivergent sort of diagnosis in the UK. There's a really simple way to do this. Um, and it's, you just type into Google, right to choose, followed by the diagnosis that you're seeking. So whether it's ADHD or autism or whatever it is, um, you put that in with the words right to choose. And there should be a service offered by psychiatry UK. I don't know if I'm getting that right, but I'll try to leave the links in the description. Um, and they have like a whole process for how to go through it. And it took a long time. It took like a few months for me to get my diagnosis. I am autistic. I was diagnosed, but, um, it took me a few months to get this diagnosis, but it is more or less foolproof. Like you write a letter, you send it to your GP, they like interact with Psychiatry UK, and then they start the process of trying to get you a diagnosis. Initially, it's a lot of form filling, which is 
not ideal for someone with ADHD or autism, but um, if you trust the process, I personally, I really liked it. I recommend it. I it, like if you want your diagnosis and you've been thinking about it for a long time, just do this. It, it, it was a bit of a lifesaver for me. So I like I took all the information out. I started filling in these forms. I handed some of these forms also to like my friends and um, my partner so they could fill them in as well because you they kind of need like a holistic uh, information on you. So from what you were like in your childhood, from what you were like in your teenage years and all of this stuff. And the more I filled in this form, the more it became apparent to me how blind I had been to my own symptoms um, and how good I was at masking, not just for other people, but for myself. <laughs> it, it was really quite shocking to me because the more I listed out these, you know, they were asking about symptoms. So the more I listed out these symptoms, the more I was like, wow, I am definitely autistic. Like I, I I'm a professional. I know what autism looks like. Autism looks like this. <laughs> so um, yeah, I filled out these forms, I submitted them, and I eventually saw a, a professional who interviewed me about my symptoms and then eventually gave my diagnosis. Not only did she give me a diagnosis for autism, she also assessed me for fibromyalgia and she gave me a diagnosis for fibromyalgia, which, oh my God, I've been pursuing that for so long. I'm so glad she gave me that diagnosis. Oh my God, thank you so much. Um, so yeah, uh, 28 years of my life not knowing. And you know, you don't develop autism. You're born with it. It's literally the way your brain works. So 28 years of being undiagnosed autistic to being autistic. And like a lot of the, like at the time, the doctors and the psych, uh, psych psychological professionals and you know this psychological professional as well was asking me like what what do you hope to gain from this diagnosis because obviously you've been living most of your life without it and for me having had the diagnosis for a long time now for me I just feel like I make so much more sense like I just have more peace within myself that like I, there's nothing wrong with me there is nothing wrong with me this whole time I thought there's something seriously wrong with me and nobody knows what the fuck it is. I don't know what the fuck it is. And I can finally sit here and say, and just go, there's nothing wrong with me. Um, and that's just so liberating to feel. You, you feel like a person, you feel like a human being and that's, that's just everything. That's all I've wanted to feel. Um, but yeah, uh, that's how I pursued my autism and fibromyalgia diagnosis, um, and that's how I got it. The other diagnoses that I started to pursue were for my mental health. As I said, my eating disorder stuff is still up in the air, but my psychotherapist and other mental health professionals have said that my eating disorder, the way that it manifests, is linked to my fibromyalgia, which is called a comorbidity. It's how your mental illnesses and your neurodivergence and basically how your brain works, all the chemicals in your brain and how they manifest, how they interact with each other. So like, yes, there is an eating disorder which that we, that we have tentatively agreed is probably bulimia. Um, but obviously I haven't seen an eating disorder service because it has not come through for me yet. And I don't even know if that is ever going to happen. Um, but uh, tentatively that's bulimia, but it also interacts with my fibromyalgia and manifests along with those symptoms. So anyway, um, I started to pursue more, you know, inquiries into my mental health and I saw a mental health professional that I will be so grateful for for the rest of my life because he knew exactly what I wanted and he also knew um, just how to just let me talk about stuff because he acknowledged that I'd been pursuing this for a long time. I explained all of this stuff to him that I've just explained to you now um, because I only saw him like last year, 2022 or 2023. Was, my brain's not awake today, but 2022, 2023 is when I started seeking, uh, you know, more in-depth diagnoses for my mental health problems. So in terms of my mood disorder, 
the way that I describe it is that it's baby bipolar. It's a condition called cyclothymia, which often develops into bipolar disorder. Uh, initially, I thought I had bipolar 1 because I had hypomanic episodes. Uh, I'm not going to sit here and define all my terms when my editor get, gets back and edits these. I'm sure he can find di like definitions and stuff and put them in the video. But for now, I'm just going to talk. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, I, he almost, after a few sessions of seeing me, after explaining my symptoms, after like filling out the forms, you know, and sort of sitting with him, he said that I probably don't have full on bipolar disorder, bipolar one or bipolar two, but I have like a lesser form of that called cyclothymia, which is similar to bipolar one, but it happens over a longer period of time. People with bipolar generally feel the effects of their mood disorder like week by week, whereas my mood disorder manifestation was happening within a month. I would have like one week of depression, a, a week of manic hypermanic stuff and then like a couple of weeks where everything sort of evens out and it's fine um so that was the first thing that he nailed down the second thing he nailed down after seeing my fibromyalgia stuff was uh he tried to nail down some trauma-informed therapies for me but that kind of fell through later down the line when he prescribed an appropriate antidepressant for me and also told me not to feel bad if I continue taking them which is what should have been done from the get-go <laughs> because again you can't play games with your brain chemistry don't play games with it um so he to address my sleeping problems he prescribed me catiapine initially it was 100 milligrams now it's 25 milligrams with um like if i'm having a harder time sleeping i can up that dose if i'm having not as hard time sleeping i can lower that dose i take that almost every night um and he put me back on sertraline which was an antidepressant i'd tried before didn't really like stopped after six months i'm on it now again on a lower dose uh i think it's a 50 milligram dose so that's been working for me since i started seeing that therapist and i probably will continue with this routine unless something drastic happens in my mental health like the chemical imbalances become way more difficult to manage at the moment they are pretty good to manage like normally after the week that i have had if i was on my routine from like four years ago bitch would be crying in this video hello um so yeah um he put me on a on medication that really really helped uh in terms of my hallucinations i really i really wanted an answer for that because it was scaring me i didn't know how to treat it and i explained to him that i had been having these hallucinations as well as conversations with these hallucinations since i was a child and he was like do you do you ever feel like you can't tell if they're not real and i was like no i i know they're not real and he was like oh, okay well you can breathe a breath of fresh air because it's not psychotic then and i was like how would you know if it was psychotic and he was like well if it was psychotic you wouldn't be able to tell if it was real or not and also if it was psychotic um they would be largely negative and from what you've told me um they aren't uh, he defined these hallucinations as de like a depersonalization disorder. The official diagnosis is other specified dissociative disorder, which a diagnosis being classed as other is not, isn't always great, but you know, it's something. Uh, I have a name for it now. I understand it a lot better. And honestly, it's it's been kind of a blessing having like living with the hallucinations and it not being a problem me not fearing them um i talk to them frequently i'm not going to talk about them in depth because i'm not quite that comfortable but to explain it in brief terms um i've compartmentalized parts of my psyche and uh i'm able to sort of address them as they bring bring problems to me uh usually their problems are quite focused um they have disparate sort of personalities and they kind of keep them to that i've named them i'm not going to talk about it further <laughs> it's a bit hard to explain uh to people who don't experience this but this is this is as far as i'm going to explain it um as to how i've been sort of coping with all this information i've tried to sort of 
discuss it with myself and sit with myself and talk about it. I've talked about it at great length with my partner who has been extremely supportive. Like he's been unimaginably supportive. I don't think uh, if I had the partners that I had in the past, they would at all understand or be accepting or be support be supportive to be honest they'd probably give me really really awful advice <laughs> as they have in the past um i'm i'm just saying that based on how they were with me at that time um but those are the ways in which i pursued my diagnoses and um where they are currently and i i wanted to just sit down and go through them because i feel like i've come really really far in terms of the journey, if you can call it that. It's been a really messy and painful and um, mind-numbing, boring journey, <laughs> but um, I think I'm better for it and I am glad that I have no tolerance for dismissal um, throughout my life. And this is really what I wanted to express in terms of this. And I, I'm really, really trying not to let it get to me because on the day that I received this, I had the the final meeting for this on Monday this week. Um, and on the day that I got my letter, which was Thursday, even though they told me after the meeting they would send this letter the next day, I hate, I hate the UK government for what it has put me through consistently. I hate them. Every single phone call I was meant to take was rescheduled once, twice, three times, always once. This tribunal was rescheduled once. The reason why these proceedings for PIP took over two years was because they kept fucking rescheduling things. And I'm fucking tired of your bullshit, okay? Um... But yeah, the, um, the day that it happened, ev everything just started falling apart. Like, I didn't, I didn't want it to fall apart. I tried to manage my expectations from before I got the letter. Everything started falling apart. The floor started spinning. People just started looking different. Um, my world was collapsing. I was like, wow, I'm, I'm, I'm not a person. I've been lying to myself. I'm not disabled. It really fucking got to me and I don't like it when things get to me and I have to admit it but it really fucking got to me and you know what throughout my life this has been this has been the reception always because I'm able to study and get a fucking first in my fucking degree and I'm able to work hard over time overwork help everyone with their work do way more than my role requires all of the fucking time consistently because I'm able to volunteer and help people and, and just like basically keep my brain occupied so I don't have to think with it on my own because usually when I do that I get to somewhere I don't want to be because I'm very good at masking and distracting my brain I'm not I'm not disabled enough to take seriously like in in this fucking letter they tell me that I have serious comorbidities and serious mental health problems, but I'm still not fucking disabled enough to help. And it's so, so fucking dehumanizing. And this isn't the only time that this has happened, like, in my life. This is obviously, like, this is from the government. Who the fuck, like, they don't care about anybody. They certainly don't care about me. But people who claim to care about me and want to know what, you know, what what makes me tick, what, um, you know, affects me, what makes my life worse, what hurts, what doesn't hurt. People who want to know those things. I have real beef with some of you. Not my closest friends, because you're, honestly... You're some of the best people in my life and I couldn't ask for better friends. But people who ask about these things and pretend to fucking care when you never let me get fucking angry about anything. I have to have a measured and calm response when I, I'm the one who's angry. 
Yeah, sorry. It's hard to maintain most of my emotions on a good day, let alone when I am upset. Um, additionally, like, everyone wants me to work on their fucking schedule. Uh, sorry, I don't control a lot of this. This happens on its own time, so I need you to understand that I can define the amount of time that I require to, like, deal with something. Like, if, if I'm telling you I require, like, time to deal with something that is an unspecified amount of time for a reason, because I don't fucking know how much time I'm going to need. So maybe, instead of insisting that I've had enough time for something, you just, I don't know, wait. Because I have to. So maybe just fucking wait. Also, perpetually, throughout my lifetime, uh, the closest people to me who claim to love me and claim to want to support me and claim to want to help me have staged fucking interventions where they'll sit there and tell me how fucking bad I'm being because I'm disabled. Um, and then not let me say anything in the way that I want to or express any real fucking emotion. Um, you can't give me ultimatums and then tell me I have a choice because I don't. All you're doing is humiliating me in front of people that claim to care about me. And you know what's the most fucking egregious is that when they are confronted about doing that to me, They'll say things like, I would do it again because you deserved it. Thank you for feeling like I deserved humiliation when I was having emotional crisis. Thank you for that. That really shows me the type of person you are. And thank you for asking me what all my weaknesses are so you can exploit them for your benefit. I never know what I do to deserve such treatment from people that I've only tried to fucking help. And it really irks me that it happens a lot and it's made it really hard to be to be vulnerable with people who deserve my vulnerability. I'm not gonna fucking cry. You can want to cry as much as you want, all of you, but I am not gonna fucking cry in this video because you know what? I don't fucking deserve it. We have suffered our whole fucking lives. We do not deserve this. Give me a sec. I am a person. I am a person who is severely mentally ill. I am a person whose comorbidities make me severely fucking ill. And I do my level best <laughs> to keep an able bodied face all of the fucking time because if I don't, I become everyone's fucking problem. So, if you would like me to help you not see me as a problem, maybe give me the time that I need to deal with something and let me deal with it. Instead of, you know, condescending me and pretending that I know, th that you know better than I do how to like look after myself. I'm sorry I don't want to talk today. I didn't realize that not talking was going to be a problem. I'm sorry that I feel so shit today that my whole body feels heavy and I can't do anything. Not so much as like go to the bathroom to have a shit. I will suffer in pain until I can't stand it anymore and then go and do it. But at this moment in time, I can't do the things that I need to do let alone the things that I would like to confront. I don't know, man. It's a real struggle when, like, I try my level best all the time. All the fucking time. And it so rarely fucking works out for me. Like, in the last year, there have been two people close to me who literally gave me shit 
for, f- for having a fucking degree. Because I was upset. Like, I struggled for five fucking years with all these issues, undiagnosed, got a first in a psychology fucking degree, and they didn't even celebrate that. Instead, because I was upset for my own fucking boundaries in my own fucking house, they gave me shit about my degree that I had just gotten and hadn't even celebrated properly. With friends like you, who needs enemies? Who needs enemies? That was the video for today. I hope it was helpful. It was certainly helpful for me in turn on, on like a venting front. Um, and I hope it explains all the nuances around being mentally ill and trying to figure yourself out. It's a, it's a really long, arduous fucking process. But for me, at least, it's been worth it in the sense that I'm, I'm just a person. People are a sum of their perceptions and their memories. Most of mine are bad and I didn't ask for them. And I'm just trying to live. And that's, that's fine. That's okay. And I don't need or want to be around people who won't see me as a fucking human being. No matter how close they think they are to me. If you can't see me as a human being, you don't respect me as a person, no matter how much you might claim to respect me as a person, um, you don't respect me as a person, let alone anything else that you might imagine about me. Um, I'm so fucking tired of everyone making, like, every like person that gets close to me making their problems, like, so my problems. <laughs> like so my problems and then like not being able to handle any modicum of problem that I'm having when I'm having it like they just people can't be patient with me my partner is like not a very patient person generally but is extremely patient with me and I'm so fucking grateful for that <laughs> I'm sorry I'm a lot to deal with. You don't have to be around me. And like, I'm getting more okay with that, but I have to be okay with that. Because if I'm not okay with that, I will constantly put myself in a position where I'm around people who do not see me as human. And that's not okay. I don't want to be around people who don't see me as a fucking human being, okay? Because it's not okay. I'm done. I'm fully done. And this is the last time that I will be crying over someone who does not see me as a fucking human being. I hope you enjoyed the video. Of course I'm crying. Uh, I'll see you in the next one. <laughs> Um, if you enjoyed this, like, share, and subscribe. Maybe leave a comment. Tell me, tell me your diagnosis and mental health woes. Maybe we can share a moment. Um, but yeah, thank you for watching and goodbye.